Hey, hey squaddies. squaddies. Welcome to this week's episode of the Travel Squad Podcast. Today, we're airing one of our most popular episodes from the past three years. We have hundreds of episodes now, and lately we've been replaying the most well-received and listened to episodes, and you all have been loving it. We're going to keep giving you what you want and give new squaddies the chance to hear past episodes without having to go digging through the archives. New episodes are still launching every other week while classics like this are airing in between. Enjoy Enjoy the the show show and and happy happy Travel Travel Tuesday. Tuesday. Welcome to the Travel Squad Podcast. We adventure the world together one passport stamp at a time. We're here to share travel news, tips, and our own adventures with you. Every Travel Tuesday, we share stories on a variety of topics, including our hometown San Diego, hiking, weekenders, national parks, international getaways, and inspiring you to go on your own adventures, even if it starts with your own backyard. I'm Jamal. Brittany. And I'm Kim. And And we're we're the the Travel Travel Squad Squad Podcast. Podcast. So grab your ticket and your passport. And don't forget your travel insurance. And prepare for takeoff. Hello, fellow travelers. Hey, 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 squaddies. Welcome to this week's episode of the Travel Squad Podcast. Today, we are taking you south of the border to the Mexican hotspot of Tulum. Jamal and I spent a full week escaping the winter temps and soaking up the sun in the tropical jungle of Tulum. Tulum has been on our bucket list for a really long time, and we finally made it a reality when our trip to Morocco was officially canceled. That sucks. That's really sad. I was bummed out about Morocco, but we had a good time in Tulum, enjoyed it, but uh, Morocco's still on that to-do list for sure. I've been to Tulum, not with you guys on this trip, but I went a couple years earlier. We were in Mexico City for our friend Nicole's wedding Mm -hmm. and very way too early in the morning, the day after the wedding, I flew over to Cancun. I think you're still a little hungover, weren't you? I think I was still drunk. (laughs) Flew into Cancun, which is the airport you'd fly into if you're going to Tulum. And I had family that was actually living there. They moved from San Diego and were living there for a couple of years. So I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to go over there. Mm-hmm. And I got to experience it for a couple of days. Yeah. So Tulum is like you just said, Kim, like you would fly into Cancun. It's about an hour and a half, two hours south of Cancun. As a matter of fact, it's become such a tourist hotspot within the last five to seven years. I think they are building an international airport. They say it's going to be open next year. I don't know how that's even possible, but they are going to be building an international airport. But it is along the Caribbean Gulf of Mexico area on the Riviera Maya, where they have all the ancient ruins and everything like that on the east coast of Mexico. Very serene, very beautiful area of Mexico. So we're going to start off this episode, as always, with some tip, tip, tips. Give me the tip. Tip in first. First tip that we have is to rent a car, especially if you're going to be here for a few days. It's so nice to have your own car to drive to all of these different destinations within Tulum and around Tulum. So that would be something I recommend. They do have car hire services as well. So if you don't want to drive, you can hire a car. It's going to be more expensive, but it's an option. The next tip is when to visit Tulum. The most optimal times are going to be November through April. And the reason for it is twofold. One, during the summer, disgustingly hot. Like, you know, I complain about the heat, disgustingly hot. I was there in June. It was disgustingly hot and humid and sweaty. And you like the heat and you like the pools and all that (laughs) stuff. And it wasn't enough. It was gross. So don't go during that time because of that aspect. Second, one thing to note about this area is it is known for sargassium. And what is that? That is when all the seaweed washes ashore to the beach and it stinks. And that happens in the summer. You definitely want to avoid that. It's going to smell. It's going to be gross. You don't want to get in the water. So go November through April. And when you do, it is going to be a paradise. Beautiful, crystal clear waters. Nice white sand beaches. You're going to have a great time. Just avoid the heat. Avoid the wash ashore of the seaweed. 
Yeah, Jamal and I went in January and that was the perfect time to go. The weather was amazing. The highs were in the 70s, 80s, and I never needed a sweater and we escaped the San Diego cold. I know you guys are probably laughing because San Diego doesn't get that cold. But when we came back to San Diego, I put on a sweater for the first time in a week. There is the occasional downpour in that area of rain. It will clear. Think of it almost like Hawaii. If you've been to Hawaii, it'll rain during certain times. So when it says it's going to rain, it's going to come down for maybe 10, 15 minutes and then clear right up. But just know that happens. Also, can't avoid it. Another tip is to do your research of where you want to stay in Tulum. Do you want to stay in the Tulum Beach area, which is kind of the bougie resort area, or do you want to stay in the town of Tulum? They have completely different vibes, so know where you want to stay in Tulum and make your reservations based off of the research you've done and the kind of trip you're feeling. Next tip is to definitely know what to pack. I mean, you're literally in a tropical jungle area, and yes, beachy also, but you're going to need a hat, sunscreen, snorkeling gear, towels, bug spray, a dry bag, collapsible cooler. We talk about it all the time. You're going to want that. You're going to want to bring your cervezas and tote to the beach and have all that good stuff. And even if you use Tulum as a hub, go other places, collapsible cooler, water shoes, because we're going to talk about the cenotes here pretty soon, umbrella, rain jacket. So you definitely need a good variety of things when you come here. So do all that research and know, but here we are telling you, definitely bring those. All right. So you guys recently went on this trip. I haven't heard a lot about it. So instead of going back and forth between what I've done and what you've done, I just want you to walk me through your trip from start to beginning because you guys were there for like a week, right? Yeah, it was a nice week long trip in that area. And really, we used Tulum as a hub. You know, we love to use places as a hub. We spent a lot of time there for sure, did many different things in that area, but utilize it as a hub. Okay, cool. So let's go through your trip. I'll just chime in with a few fun things that I did because mine was very different than yours. But what day did you take off? So we actually took off Friday after work. We drove from San Diego to CBX and we entered the TJ terminal. And I think our flight was like at 1 a.m. Ooh, and CBX, by the way, is Cross Border Express. It's this cool little bridge you can pay to cross from San Diego to Tijuana and you get much better flight prices. Well, not only just the bridge into Tijuana, it's direct into the airport itself. So it's a great American terminal for you to start flying domestically now within Mexico or to Latin America. Brittany and I live like two, three exits away from that. So really, really close, really, really convenient. And we had a red eye into Cancun that day, Friday, which was technically, I guess at that point, Saturday Saturday morning. morning. All right. And so the reason why we booked out of TJ was because it was $250 cheaper per person to fly out of TJ versus San Diego. And it was a direct flight. There were no layovers or connections. Had we flown from San Diego to Cancun, all of the flights that we were seeing were not direct. Perfect. So you flew Friday, technically Saturday. What time did you get in Saturday? 7 a.m. Yeah, we landed at 7 a.m. Another reason Brittany didn't mention that we also chose that route beyond the money saving and the convenience of direct flight is we're still traveling in the day and age of COVID. You still have entry requirements to fly back into the United States. That entry requirement is a negative COVID test. You know what they don't have negative COVID test requirements for? Land crossing. So we avoided having to find a place to take a test in Mexico to fly back into the United States states because we were flying into Tijuana and crossing via land, at which point you don't need the test. But rest assured for most of you people who do not live here along the border and have that convenience that we do, every place and every corner that we were at in Tulum or Cancun had rapid COVID tests to take at a very reasonable price for you to have to fly back. So we were concerned about that. We didn't know that until we were there and saw it, but they are there for you guys. You know, I know this sounds really, really terrible. But during January, that's when a huge surge hit the US again in terms of COVID. And most of my employees got COVID and I was convinced that I was going to get COVID. And I was like, I'm going to end up with COVID in Mexico. And I didn't want to get stuck there. There is a lot of research around building up your immunity through exposing yourself to a lot of foods, having a pet in home that brings things from the outside, keeping your windows open, that builds up your immunity. So I am convinced that travel actually directly supports your immune system, which is why the three of us have not gotten COVID. Fuck yeah. Fingers crossed. Let's keep it that way. We're going to rock it hard. (laughs) 
<laughs> but let's get into day one Saturday. Like we said, we landed in Cancun around 7 a.m. So if this episode inspires you to go to Tulum and you go in a year or two, you may be able to have that direct flight. But for now, you for sure have to fly into Cancun. From there, we rented a car that we already had reservations for. The rental car location that we chose was not at the airport. They had a shuttle come pick us up and take us to the place. And we booked our rental car from rentalcars.com. And I would recommend doing that for your international booking. Even though it wasn't at the airport? Well, you know, there didn't seem to be a lot. I, I feel like a lot of places would take you on a shuttle regardless. Mm, okay. There was a few places in the airport where they had concierge stuff stands for certain major rental car companies like Hertz, Enterprise, stuff like that. But I think that was just to talk to somebody. You still had to really leave the airport to hmm. go get your car. But our vendor that we used, which was like American rental cars, wasn't at the airport. So they had a shuttle come pick us up. One thing and tip I want to give to you guys about that is in Mexico, they definitely do require that you have insurance, just like here in the United States. Now, the main insurance that you have is liability insurance. When you rent a rental car, the liability insurance automatically comes. That's in case you, God forbid, hurt or hit somebody, right? However, most rental car companies do require you to purchase insurance on the vehicle itself. They will state it expressly like, I don't care if you have other insurance or a credit card that actually covers it, does this or that, you need to buy the rental car insurance. So just be prepared for that. So you can't show them the credit card insurance coverage? Well, for certain companies, you can't. And a lot of the big name companies that we are aware of here in the United States, like Hertz, Enterprise, they say on their website, like, you have to buy it. I don't mm, care. Okay. One of the reasons why we went through American Rental Cars is they said that they would actually accept your credit card insurance as primary coverage, but you actually had to print out a letter that was provided by your credit card that actually showed that you had coverage. I did that and I'm gonna not lie to you guys here. I know they were hustling us and telling us like, oh, like even though we had this, we had to put down a very minimal uh, deposit or something like that. And they're saying, oh, well, we can't ha run this through. It's not taking. Minimal deposit, $8,000 Oh yeah, 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 deposit. well, yeah, you're right. Sorry, it was $8,000 deposit that they were gonna put as a hold on our credit card. The minimal deposit was the deposit when we finally actually had to purchase the insurance because they were acting like they couldn't put the hold on our card but the moment that we oh, bought the the moment that we slick. yeah the moment that we bought the insurance they still put a hold on the card for much less and then they were like oh this hold is taking but i even called my credit card company they even uh -huh. got on the loan with <laughs> on the line with visa and visa's like no no we're not doing it the credit card company so i know they hustled us but it's like at that point what am i supposed to right. to do so they forced our hand and made us buy it so point being of that long story and side tangent is be prepared to just buy the rental car coverage. And as I was talking about earlier, do your research on where you want to stay. We actually decided to stay in an Airbnb because we were going to be there for a week. And so we stayed at an Airbnb in a condo complex. And it was amazing. They were staffed with a front desk. Someone showed us to our unit. They told us about the complex. And we were even able to check in early. Awesome ass pool too. Awesome ass pool. Yeah, the pool was shaped in the shape of an O. So the middle was carved out and you could look down onto the first floor. Where Did there you like get that iconic picture from above? You know, uh, I was trying to, but we, we didn't get that shot because you'd have to actually, one person would have to be in the pool and uh -huh. then you'd have to run down to the first floor to get. And then your camera wouldn't be good. You would have to have like uh, a photo stick thing to hang it out to really get it. But basically <laughs> the pool looks down to the the first floor and the pool is on the fourth floor but the bottom level is truly like a beautiful like atrium with plants and trees growing in there a beautiful boardwalk plank that goes over fountain and some water so it was a really pretty scenic shot like when we showed you the photos you were like oh man i wish i was staying here mm -hmm. so it was a really nice place and quite honestly i'm just going to tell you this but i mean you know from your listenings if you've been a listener for a long time Brittany and i's like travel style like yeah sometimes we like to bougie it up but bougie and party sometimes goes 
together. And in the resort area of Tulum, that's where it's like really, really, you know, expensive. And it wasn't even like a price issue. It's just not our scene. So we stayed more in the city center and not the resort area. But even in the city center areas, they're building a lot of these Airbnbs that are a lot nicer. And I think it's really conducive versus being out in the resort area because it's so crowded and just they didn't build it very well, if you want me to be completely honest with you. That's my opinion, at least. But because we had a red eye flight, we were pretty tired. So we checked in, we took a quick nap, and then we spent the rest of the day just lounging at the pool and just really soaking up the sun, getting to know our area. We were staying in in a part of town that was starting to be built. And so they had some good taco shops and taquerias down the street. So we went and got tacos later and we got some really good birria tacos and queso tacos. Yeah. And even though we weren't in the resort area, do keep in mind, you know, there's the true city center of Tulum, classic, like true Mexico. But also before you get into the resort area, clearly a lot of tourists come here. It's built up. So we had those things very readily close also. So that's Saturday. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a travel and a chill day. Amazing pool for it. Sunday. I know you didn't chill by the pool. We did not. But before we get into Sunday, the last thing I want to say, because I did a lot, a lot of research on this. A lot of people are always timid about driving in Mexico. I'm fine with it close to the border here, but this was my first time like driving truly like in the heart of Mexico, like deep and everything like that. Whatever research it is that you do, I'm going to tell you this. The roads are very safe. They are well paved. They are beautiful highways. So anywhere from Cancun to Tulum is safe. Anywhere from Tulum further south, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, also very safe, also very well paved. So do your research, get your comfort online, but I am here to attest to you. Very, very nice, awesome roads out there. That's a good point to bring up. The other thing I commonly hear from people that don't know a lot about Mexico is the fear that you can get pulled over and the cops will ask you for money. What's your experience there? Did you see any of that? What would you say to reassure someone who has that fear? I would say we've been to Mexico many times in many different places, and I had never, ever had that ever occur to us. If it was to occur, anything that I've read online is don't argue and just pay it. Because if you want to be a smart ass gringo and talk back to them, they're going to take you to jail and it's going to create more problems for you. But I can attest to you, never happened. And the military and police checkpoints you see on the road are for your safety, not for you to be hustled. Great point. And I would agree. I've never heard of anybody getting pulled over and the cops forcing them to pay. I have heard of people in Tulum and Cancun, people I know very personally, who were urinating in public areas. You're out drinking. It is a big party area. Mm -hmm. The cops pull up. They are like, what the hell are you doing? 20 bucks, you're out of there. Pay it and get the hell out of there. Or just don't do it in the first place. Yeah, and that's people asking for it too by doing something technically illegal, right? But yeah, in general, nobody's there hustling you. But day two, Kim, you're right. We didn't stay by the pool. We didn't chill. We hit the ground running and we went to the Tulum Mayan ruins. And these are the famous ruins the Tulum area is known for. They're right on the water. They're on these elevated cliffs above the ocean. I think they're about 200 feet above the ocean. And they're so scenic. It's super beautiful. And it doesn't cost a lot to get in. It's only 85 pesos to enter, which is the equivalent of like $4 and change. Yeah, because 20 pesos is equivalent to $1. So realistically, like $4.25 per person to get in to see some ancient Mayan ruins. And this area of Mexico is called Costa Maya. There's tons of Mayan ruins in the area, not just in Tulum, north, south, inland, etc. And we're going to touch upon that later because we went to many, many different ruins on this trip. So, I mean, we did this first and foremost going to those ruins. Like Brittany said, not very very expensive. We spend approximately two hours there. The ruins, quite honestly, aren't as impressive as other ruins I'm in the so area. I'm so glad you said that. They're, they're I thought not. the same thing when I went. They're not. But what makes it is the fact that it's on a yes. sea cliff overlooking mm-hmm. the ocean. Yes. So it is an experience worth seeing. But are they the best ruins you'll ever see in your life? No. And there's several ruins and they get deeper and deeper into the jungle. So the closer it is to the ocean, they are the most worn, torn and damaged, not as preserved because it has the easiest access to people. The farther you get back into the jungle, the more preserved and bigger they are. 
Yeah. And probably the reason why the ones on the coast are more damaged, that sea salt in the air, the wind on the coast, those damage it. But also the, these ruins were built because Tulum was a big trade area, specifically for like obsidian and a whole bunch of people from Central America and other parts of Mexico came here. And they actually built this area too, to protect it from pirates, mm-hmm. which I didn't know originally. And then I learned that when we were there, which was pretty interesting. How did you learn it? Did you do a tour? Did you read it? Um, I want to say I read it somewhere and I was like, okay, because we didn't do a tour here. And the reason why we didn't do a tour here was because we were saving doing a tour for Chichen Itza, which we'll get into later in the episode. But Jamal's right. You know, these ruins are very scenic, but yeah, they're not the most impressive ruins. So Kim, your juices probably weren't flowing like at 100%. My juices were a little like underwhelmed. And that's sad for you because I know... The juices were still there though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) It was was moderate. It wasn't like high level, right? Yeah, it was like a summertime waterfall, not a spring one. Yeah, like slightly moist. (laughs) (laughs) But some tips, like when you're here, definitely wear lightweight, cool, comfortable clothing. I mean, even in January, it's hot. It's humid slightly, not like terribly, but you definitely don't want to wear stuff that's going to make you warm. You know, you're by the beach, be comfortable comfortable about it don't want swamp ass you don't want swamp ass to give you an idea i wore jean shorts and i couldn't even peel them off my skin Oh my God, ah, in June. this is God, in that June, sucks. right? Yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. God. and again, going back to the original tips that we gave, like seriously, don't go during summer. Like you will do yourself <laughs> a disservice by going here during the summer. On top of that, last final few tips about the Mayan ruins here in Tulum is to go around opening or at opening. It's not going to be as crowded. So you're going to enjoy it a lot more to yourself and only buy tickets from the ticket booth. Don't trust anybody out on the streets trying to sell you anything or do this or that only buy tickets from the ticket booth another tip i'm going to add too is there are two different places where you can park there's an actual parking area where you can pay to park to go visit the tulum ruins we didn't park there we actually were accidentally but awesomely mapped to park on the same street as the beach and so we parked there and walked to the ruins which would be the same distance from walking to the parking lot and then when we were done touring the ruins we were able to go straight to the beach. Yeah, it was really cool because, you know, I thought for sure we were in the wrong spot because it wasn't like the parking lot and everything you read online will say that there's a parking lot. It costs this much to park. So that main touristy area that I mentioned that have all the hotels and resorts that aren't part of like the true like real downtown, that stretch area leads into the national park here where these ruins are. But it's free parking along the way because it's public beach access right there. So you can actually park along that stretch of road for free, go to the ruins when you're done, finish off at the beach. And that is exactly what we did. We went to Playa Paracio, if I'm saying that correctly. And, you know, we mentioned earlier that we packed a collapsible cooler and it came in clutch. We packed it with beers and snacks. And so right after the ruins, we headed to the beach. We packed our Turkish towels, laid them out, got a prime spot on the sand. And it was perfect. I love Mexico. You don't know why? Because drinking on the beach and they don't care. Woo! If you don't bring the collapsible cooler, rest assured vendors are going to be out there (laughs) selling you beers for relatively inexpensive, right? And, you know, these people are private vendors. Negotiate the price. And I'll tell you why. Because we bought mangoes, which Brittany love, covered with the chili, 50 pesos. We went back to the beach another day on this trip. Somebody tried to tell me 150 pesos. Was it 100? 100, 150 pesos. I don't remember. I was like, no way. Did you dare? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. I was like, <laughs> solo cincuenta, my friend. And then he's like, okay, okay. Oh. So negotiate the prices, but only if they seem to be you ridiculous. You heard it here first. Don't pay more than 50 pesos for the mango. Mm-hmm. Correct. Correct. We bought a coconut for 80 pesos. So worth it for one, the coconut water is amazing. But two, the pictures you get when you're propped up in your bathing suit or in the water. Kim knows all about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear that you guys did that. Got to do it for the gram. So the regular Coco Locos here with the just straight coconut and cold, it's about 80 pesos. You could pay equivalent to $10 for fresh coconuts and coconut water, and then we'll spike it with the alcohol of your choosing for about 10 bucks on the beach. I mean, that was really our day in a nutshell. We explored the Tulum ruins, went to the beach, 
we were staying at an Airbnb. So we did some grocery shopping because we always wanted to have like breakfast and a few things maybe to take for lunch on the days that we weren't in town. And I will say this, we didn't touch upon this earlier. This is the first time I've been to Mexico and felt like I paid way too much money for a lot of things. Like it is expensive. And the reason why it's expensive out there is because they know that there's a lot of tourists. So things are not inexpensive. And I was like blown away eating out there every day will definitely add up and it's something that you definitely shouldn't do like even local spots are expensive okay question tacos you can get a taco around tj for a dollar maybe two dollars on the high end in tulum how does that compare street tacos like if you want to call them like authentic ones Mm -hmm. Maybe about two to two fifty uh, starting price, and they only get higher from that. You go Damn. to a place that's not like a local taqueria, but not like a fancy place either. Then they start getting a lot more expensive. Like yeah. Brittany and I did breakfast one place at one restaurant that had like really good reviews of someplace great to eat. And we paid like, what, $25, $30 for breakfast for two entrees. Mm -hmm. And that is expensive. I mean, that is expensive for Mexico, Mm -hmm. especially compared to what we're used to here at the border or even in Mexico City for that matter. So Mm -hmm. definitely, you know, keep that in mind. Expensive place to visit food wise. Now, average is American prices, but for Mexico, expensive. It's very hyped up and it's very popular with the cool crowd of of Americans. Mm -hmm. And they know that. And they lots, cater to that. Yeah, lots of Europeans and lots of Russians out there too. Mm-hmm. It's a really big hot spot for Europeans. Canadians as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually, when we were laying out at the pool at our Airbnb, we heard some like Canadians and Aussies. Came across some Canadians, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but day three was Monday, and day three was probably my favorite day and favorite excursion that we did this entire trip. And we went to the Muyil ruins. And they're about 20 minutes south of Tulum. And this place really had it all. It had ruins. And then it also had a jungle boardwalk. And then at the end, you hop on a boat and you go across a lagoon. And then you do like a little float down a river. So this was the must do of Tulum. And if anyone's going to Tulum, I would say this would be number one on my list. This might be my favorite day. Maybe my other favorite day was Chichen Itza. I still really can't decide. But things to do close to Tulum. And like Brittany said, 20 minutes. This is a must. The ruins, again, bigger than the Tulum ruins themselves. Are they the most impressive I've ever seen ever? No. Is this actually more in the jungle? Yes. Yes. So it gives it like a cool little vibe. We even saw monkeys monkey. out here, Kim. Monkeys Mm -hmm. in the jungle. And then, like Brittany said, you know, you are in the jungle, but you are close to the ocean and all these like beautiful estuaries, fresh and salt water. So we took that boardwalk out to that area, had to walk a little bit more into the jungle. Then we took a boat ride out and did what she said, where we're just chilling at the, what would you call that? Like a canal? Or yeah, what was it? They like- had, so there's two larger lagoons and they've made these canals to connect them. They're man-made canals to connect them and they use them for trade. And I think once you get to the larger lagoon, they've made some more canals for trade. And so they had docked at like a little boardwalk area and they said, okay, we're going to dock here. You're going to get out. And they literally have you take off your life jacket, put it on through your legs instead of through your arms, and then you buckle it. And so it's like a big adult diaper. (laughs) That's what they called it. They called it life jacket diaper. Diaper. And then you jump in and then you just like float down the canal and the current just kind of like takes you. But it's like a very slow, gentle, lazy river almost. It was so cool. So, I mean, I know we kind of jumped to that, but just a little bit more about the Muyo Pyramids. As far as they know and can tell, I mean, this is one of the earliest Mayan settlements. They found artifacts that date back as far back as 350 BC. The main pyramid structure that you're going to see is called El Castillo, the castle. It's about 57 feet tall. And like I said, you know, truly not the most impressive of ruins are still cool, but the whole atmosphere of where it is makes it a lot more exciting than what I felt at the Tulum ruins. I felt like I was honestly at Disneyland about to get on Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. Like it had that like little jungly vibe and everything to it. But the lagoon area that we did, I mean, that was the most impressive. So to see the ruins and 
go in there, it's about 65 pesos. Then when you're done at the ruins, you have to go on that little boardwalk that we talked about. It's a boardwalk plank because you're in the jungle. It's kind of swampy and you know lots of other stuff. So they charge you 50 pesos for that per person. Not necessarily terrible. And then it was what, a thousand pesos per, per person? person for the boat tour on the big, big lagoons until it takes you to the spot where you have the canals and utilize it like a lazy river. But you're out in the jungle out there, crystal clear waters, fish swimming with you. You want to snorkel and everything. So fun. Like this was honestly like truly, truly my favorite day. Or again, I can't really tell if it was Chichen Itza, but this was the highlight of Tulum area specifically for me. What was really funny is I had put it in Google Maps and sometimes Google will tell you like if a place is busier than normal and it said this place was busier than normal. I was like, oh, Jamal, we need to get there like as quick to opening as possible. And we get there. We're literally like the only ones there enjoying the ruins. And then when we got to the boat, we were the only ones that got on the boat. So it was like we had a private tour the entire day which was fantastic and I had done some research before we went about taking a tour to this area originally and we were looking at like Viator and some other companies and they were quoting about $175 per person we ended up paying like $55 per person yeah I was gonna say no don't do the Viator tours I mean if you rent a car drive yourself it's gonna be cheaper if you didn't rent a car catch a cab it's only 20 minutes south of Tulum. Make the cab wait there for you. It's not going to be as expensive. And you can do this for so much cheaper. Like literally do not do like any Viator tour or anything tip. like that. Yeah. It was yeah. outrageously expensive. Yeah. Because I was looking at like several different tours. Like when we got to Chichen Itza and everything was close to like $200 per person. And I was like, well, if we run a car and we do it ourselves, are we going to save a lot of money? And yes, the answer is you're going to save a ton of money. So do that. Yeah, because before we were going to rent a car, like you said, we were really thinking about, all right, well, are we just going to book tours every day from Tulum? And that added up like exponentially and fast compared to like renting the cars and paying out of pocket. So if you're comfortable driving and you should be, as I'm telling you, these roads are fine, you're safe, nobody's hustling you, that is the way to go versus purchasing them through companies. Hey, squaddies, let's take a quick detour to talk about our travel itineraries that we've created just for you. We just launched several new international trip itineraries, including Tulum and Japan. This is on top of the itineraries we already have for U.S. trips like the Hawaiian Island of Kauai, the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as national park trip itineraries, including Utah's Mighty Five National Parks and a week at Grand Teton and Yellowstone. These fully built out 20 to 30 page PDF guides are available for instant download on our site right now. Every detail of the trip is laid out for you, so all you have to do is download, book, show up, and have fun. The itineraries tell you where to fly into, the exact route to take, where to stay, park entrance prices, where to eat, driving distance between attractions, the things to see and do, even the hikes we recommend, their mileage, and the time to allot for each one. And believe it or not, so much more. Be sure to head over to TravelSquadPodcast.com to download your very own comprehensive travel itinerary today. So on our way back from Muyil, going back to Tulum, there were two cenotes that are actually right across the street from each other that we decided that we were going to go visit. And so they're Cenote Crystal and Escondido. Yeah. And before we get too deep into this, I mean, I said this area of Mexico is famous for the Mayan ruins. It's also famous for the cenotes. And if you don't know what cenotes are, they are natural water holes that are created out of limestone. Some of them look like little ponds. Some of them more like collapsed caves and truly are caves where they're like big, deep swimming holes. And there are so many, like literally hundreds in this area of Mexico, tons all around Tulum. So we went to Cenotes Cristal and Escondido on these days. In this area, there's actually a massive underground river system that they're still exploring and mapping today. It's humongous. And that's where the cenotes come from. Oh, yeah. Well, speaking of them doing mapping, when we were at the cenotes, they have explorers and snorkel gear mm -hmm. that are going because even that's though, how they map it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I said, just Google cenotes, you're going to see a wide variety of them. And they're, they're beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. A lot of the cooler ones are the ones that are truly like sunken holes and like caves. But some of them, they are sunken, but the water level is so high that you just can't really tell and they look like ponds. But nonetheless, they are caves. So people like have to actually swim deep and are in snorkel 
snorkel gear and doing all this and mapping it. So very popular in the area. If you're going to come to Tulum in this region of Mexico, you need to go to a cenote. Mm -hmm. So it was about 300 pesos per person to visit both. And they're right across the street from each other. So first we went to Cenote Cristal. And this is a open cenote, so it does look like a big pond. But there is a very large wooden platform that's probably like 20 feet above the water that you can climb up and then jump off into the pond or the cenote in. And we did see people snorkeling and they said they were seeing turtles and fish. And this one's more of a laid back cenote area. So there was picnic tables and it just had like a more laid back vibe to it. Yeah. And I want to say a couple of things here. One, bring either snorkel gear or goggles because Mm -hmm. the water is usually clear and you're going to be seeing fish and wildlife under there, let alone caves for that matter and the structures that they have in there. So you're definitely going to want that. Two, you know, I hate cold water. I pussyfoot around and get in cold water. It was hard for me (laughs) to get into these cenotes because it was really, really cold. So do keep that in mind. They're all really, really cold. So maybe if you happen to come in the summer, it'll be nice and refreshing for you. But my last and most important tip is I don't know what's going on. Anything that you look at online that talks about reviews or prices of any of the cenotes are wrong. All of them are wrong. Whatever they say, triple, if not quadruple the price. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's happened in the last like year and a half, two years other than COVID, but I can't imagine that's like the only reason why they raised the prices. But every cenote that we looked at, we saw a price, went there, and it was easily triple that price since the last time people have done reviews or updated Well, it. if it's anything like the airport, maybe it's a manufactured review to make you think it costs something and then you get there and it actually costs something else. You know what? Probably. And I'll tell you what, when we get to it, the best cenote we went to was the cheapest one also. Like all of these will say like 50, 100 pesos and all of them were like 300 and so. I mean, if you add up, like I think Brittany and I for one of them paid 25 bucks per person to go in. Like that's crazy. And if you're going to do a lot of the ones in the area, that definitely adds up. So then after we were at Cenote Cristal, we went across the street to Cenote Escondido. And this cenote is for a more adventure swimmer because there is like more of a cave on one of the back ends. And so we did see scuba divers going down. It's so interesting because they tie a line around the ladder that gets you into the cenote and they go explore those caves pretty deep. And so they follow that line back out. So that was really cool to see. And there was some rope swing so you can swing in on the rock ledges and jump into the cenote so this one looks like more like a very long kind of river so we swam across it a few times and then I got out in the middle because no one's really in the middle areas they're kind of on one side or the other and I just floated for a bit of time which was really really nice and relaxing they're very scenic I mean just water holes in the jungle I mean how can you really go wrong about that so I mean, that was our day exploring, doing all that stuff. And then day four, the next day, was dedicated specifically to exploring more of the cenotes in the area. I mean, we went to Cristal and Escondido, but a lot of these cenotes are on private land, so they're owned by independent people. So these were two cenotes, but owned by the same person. So you just crossed from one to the other. So here, day four, we spent specifically going to different ones and specific specifically ones that were rated highest and the best in the area. Yeah, so a few things about the cenotes. You're not supposed to wear sunscreen into them because you want to preserve the wildlife and the ecosystem of the cenote. And most cenotes will require you to shower before you get in. And some of them even require you to rinse your hair, get your hair wet so that you can even get into the cenote. Some cenotes specifically require life jackets where you can only get in if you have a life jacket. So that was very interesting as well. When I was there, I went to one called Dos Ojos. It was absolutely gorgeous. Had the whole cave vibe. You can swim in a whole like O circle around. Dos Ojos was on our list. We didn't end up doing it. it. Yeah. So that one they don't require. Well, when I went, they didn't require the shower, hair washing type of situation. Really? So I feel like that may have changed since you've gone and we've gone. Maybe it's a COVID thing. Because every cenote we went into was like, no, you have to shower. Like that was something you, you pretty much you had to do. Even into some of the smaller ones. But we mentioned earlier there's like the cave cenotes the semi-open ones and then the open ones do you guys know which is the older cenote the closed cave cenote or the more open I cenotes? Wanna say the closed cave it's actually the open cenotes that are the older ones because it's been broken down yeah mm-hmm. and how old 
You know, I don't know how old specifically, but I do know that they are older cenotes. Yeah, so on this day, and here comes the cenote that we told you cost 25 bucks a person. 500 pesos per person equals 25 was Grand Cenote. Now, like I said, there's lots of them that are in the area, but the area could be large, you know, several miles up to like 50, 100 miles away, like literally hundreds of them. But this Grand Cenote is so close to central Tulum that it makes it very, very popular. And when I got there, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like 50 bucks total for me in Brittany. I feel like I'm getting robbed. Like I know the St. Mexico <laughs> prices. And then I walked inside and then I realized like, oh, I realize why they're charging this for me. And then I wasn't upset anymore. They have a nice area with grass that they've created for you to lounge in that's actually, you know, in the sun. And then you look down and you see the cenote and you're just like, oh my God, look at these natural caves. I'm seeing turtles swimming all right here. They have all these decks laid out that they've built up for stairs to enter. And then you get in and then you just really see how cool these caves are because the two cenotes we did before like i said they were almost kind of like little lakes or ponds this one was the one that actually had cave walls up high we saw stalagmites stalactites the water's crystal clear we had our snorkel gear fishable Fit, yeah this was so so awesome i loved grand cenote like honestly i will say if you're gonna do one in tulum area do grand cenote pay the price and do it yeah, and there are actually two sets of stairs with these wooden boardwalks and they connect through like a another cenote, like a cave that you can swim through. But the scenery there was just so amazing. And there are parts of it, it wasn't super crowded. So there were times that we were in a cave area by ourselves, or we were in the back area where there was that second stair area and boardwalk. We had that area to ourselves for like 10, 15 minutes at least. So it was spacious enough and there was definitely people People around but we also felt like we had it privately too yeah like honestly this was going to be the one that i recommend to do for sure in central tulum area is grand cenote so we spent a good bit of time here one of the other ones that we saw that we wanted to go ahead and do was going to be Cenote Calavera. But I think I jumped a little bit ahead because now I'm thinking of something. They actually have lockers to rent at Grand Cenote. Very inexpensive to do. So put your phone, put your stuff in there and just bite the bullet and pay, what was it, like 50 pesos mm -hmm. to rent a locker and do it. So they have that at least here. But Cenote Calavera also came up highly recommended for the area. Was it the best cenote that we went to? No. Was it a truly a deep cenote like watering hole? Yes. You had to take a ladder down into it or you could jump straight into it. It's like literally an open hole into the cave and your water. I'm looking at pictures on Google and I see a swing. Was there the swing there? The swing, swing was, was there. there. Did you go on it? I did. Yeah. Yes. But you can only get on the swing when you're in the water. So to get in the water, you either have to jump or take that ladder that you see. And what right did there. you do? We jumped in and then we took the ladder out. I don't think I took the ladder down at all. The ladder was super steep. So it was, to me, it was like easier to jump in. When we actually got to Cenote Calavera, they said, you know, there's 30 people here. Are you okay with that? And we're like, 30 people, that's nothing. So we went and it's a cool vibe. Like they had hammocks that you could lay out in if you're like, want to lay out for a bit. They had like, you know, their beach chairs and then they have kind of everyone around the cenote and taking turns jumping in uh it looks small like i know you came you're looking at pictures it looks like a very small opening once you actually jump in you can see how big the cave actually is and while you're walking on the top of that you're walking all over the cave and this cave has a ton of bats inside it was actually really interesting and really cool to swim around the cave and just like look up and see all of the bats above you yeah so there's that big giant hole that we're talking about if you're walking on the surface and aren't in the cenote, there's smaller holes that you could potentially even jump into if you wanted to that create like little openings. We didn't end up doing that, but Brittany is right. Once you are in there, the cave just opens up. You see how far back it goes, the stalagmites. You're so close to the bats that are just nesting right there. It's actually really, really cool to see. Maybe it'll freak some people out, but I will say this. This is not a good cenote to go to for snorkeling because 
it is rather dark in there. So you can't really see too much for snorkeling aspect wise, but nature wise and the coolness of it, I would say is really unique. And I don't think we mentioned this. It's about 250 pesos per person. So like 1250. While we were on this trip, I actually posted a story to the squad's Instagram and it was a photo of Jamal lounging in a hammock. And I was like, you guys, I do let Jamal rest every once in a while. And this is where it was. Cenote Calavera. You got one moment of rest on the whole trip. Nice. Only one moment of rest. (laughs) And there were more that were on our list to do in the area. But quite honestly, like at least for us, other people will be different. Like I could only do so many like cenotes. And you did a lot. Yeah. A lot. Absolutely. So my tip for doing cenotes in Tulum is to definitely bring more cash than you think you need because most of the cenotes only accept cash and they've gone up in price from what you've seen online. And then if you want to rent lockers or if you, some of them have like food in the area, if you want any of that, like you're going to pay. So make sure you're bringing more money than you anticipate. So day five of our trip, we actually went out of Tulum because we said we used Tulum as a hub and we went to Bacalar. Bacalar. We've heard a lot about this from Zaina. She really hyped it up. She really hyped it up and we enjoyed our time. We're going to get into it a little bit later. I don't know if we went on an off day or what was going on. But so what is Bacalar? Bacalar is about two hours south of Tulum. It is close to the big city of Chetumal, which is right on the border with Belize. So you're not too far from another country when you're here in Bacalar. And Bacalar is famous for its crystal clear blue water lagoons. They say there's seven different shades of blue. At least. When Brittany and I were there, we counted five. Maybe our eyes aren't too sharp to see the other two or more. Well, you both wear glasses. Were you wearing them? (laughs) I was wearing my prescription sunglasses Kim. <laughs> and so i don't know if that affected the ability to see the other shades but let me tell you something it is beautiful out here they call this area the mexican maldives they actually Ooh. build hotels and resorts that are over the water itself and it kind of gives you that nice relaxation vibe it is a lot more mellow than tulum tulum up until about like five seven years ago was a sleepy kind of town people discovered it coming further and further south from cancun and I promise you in about five years, Bacalar is going to be at the same level as Tulum with people coming further and further south. So we definitely enjoyed our time here. They have an old fortress. They actually used to protect this area from pirates that used to come and invade the area. So you can really see that. But the activities is to enjoy the lagoon and everything like that. And it's a nice little sleepy town. You know, we got there first thing in the morning and then we realized when we got there, like no one's out yet. It is that sleepy town Jamal's talking about. And also one thing to note as well is we thought the whole lake would be open, but a lot of it is privately owned. And so there's only a few private areas on the lake that you can go to. We ended up finding one area that was like a public area. You had to pay an entrance to get in. It was like 40 pesos a person, not much at all. And it took us a while to find this place, but they had like a seating area a cabana seating area that you could sit out we had brought in our cooler and our snacks and all of that and then you could get into the water they had a ladder to get into the water and then they had these decks in the middle of the lagoon that you could walk or swim out to and we brought our dry bags with our towels in them so we went out there laid out and just like read and lounged on the deck over the water well that's nice it was really it was it was really nice so i think where i say I don't want to say we were led astray. Like this area is very, very beautiful. If you were to stay in one of those resorts that's over the water like they do in the Maldives, I mean, you're going to have a really good time. But this is a lagoon and it's fresh water. So the ocean is not too far off. So in terms of like the water, it's beautiful. It's crystal clear. But in terms of sea life, I mean, it's a lagoon. It's not as prevalent as you would find like ocean life or, you know, other types of sea life. So take that with a grain of salt. Also, we read online that one of the biggest things to do is to just rent a boat. They have so many vendors out there where you could rent a boat. They'll take you out for an hour up to five, depending on what you want to do, and just take you all around the lagoon. It's very, very large. You could jump in, do some swimming. I don't know if they're closed on Wednesdays because we went on Wednesdays. We could not find any fucking place that was giving boat tours. So we had to go to that one beach resort area that Brittany had mentioned where we just went in. It was like 50 pesos a person. We had a table and we're just out there and it was still really, really nice. So 
I would say like we did research and I felt like a lot, but definitely do a little bit more. I don't know what happened. Like even later on in the day, I didn't see anybody out on the water on a boat. No, we didn't see anyone on a boat. We saw like one couple on a kayak and that was who we saw on the water. So I think it was hyped up for me. Like I'll be completely honest. I felt like Bacalar was hyped up in terms of what I had heard before, but I did really enjoy what we did there. And it was a nice relaxing day in the middle of the week. So day six was a day that I was really excited about. Kim, if you were moist with the Tulum ruins, (laughs) this one would have been a downpour over here (laughs) at Chichen Itza. I know. I really want to go there. Chichen Itza is one of the new seven wonders of the world. It is the... So it's the eighth? One of the new seven wonders. You know, there's the old ancient seven wonders, like the pyramids of Egypt are one of them. I think the Colossus of Rhodes or the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, they don't exist anymore, but we know that they existed. So there's the ancient seven wonders. This is new. So even though they're old, they're not ancient antiquity timeline old in mm. terms of humans. So one of the new seven wonders of the world, a UNESCO heritage site, and a two-hour drive from Tulum in a different state. Tulum is in the Mexican state of Quintana Roo. This is in the state of Yucatan. And there is a time change. We learned this. There is a time change of one hour going into Yucatan. Yeah. So one tip that I read was to get up early and beat the crowds. We actually got there right at opening thanks to the time change. We thought we were going to get there an hour after it opened, but they're an hour behind Tulum. And so we got there right when it opened and there was still a pretty large line to get in. When I did my research, I read, you know, if there's a place that you rent a guide and hire one, Chichen Itza would be the place. And so while we were standing in line, a guide came up to us. He was like, would you guys like to do a tour with me today? He's like, you get to bypass the line. And we're like, okay, cool. And we're like, how much is the tour? I think it was the equivalent of about $50, $55 US. And so we're like, okay, cool. So we bypassed the entire line, paid for the tour and went right in with him. And he was amazing. He was like, okay, we're going to be in this area. Go ahead and go all around Chichen Itza and take all of the pictures you want. And then when you're done, meet me over here and we'll learn about the history of it. Well, Chichen Itza is the complex. He said, go all around the major pyramid Pyramid. because this is the pristine and most famous of the Mayan ruins in this area, Chichen Itza. And so when we said it's one of the new seven wonders of the world, all of Chichen Itza is not. That pyramid itself is one of the new seven wonders. So since we were there so early, he said, hey, we're going to hold up on the tour. You're not going to get an opportunity like this probably ever where nobody is in front of the pyramid. You could get really good photos. So I highly recommend getting there early just so you can beat the crowds and get those photos. But the tour was absolutely amazing. So much history. You know, they don't have any signs really up to tell you what it is that you're looking at. When you're there, you're going to see it. You're going to be impressed, but you're not going to know anything about it. So I would highly, highly recommend getting one of the guided tours. They all have badges that they are certified tour guides and vendors in the area. And we actually got really lucky. You know, they told us how much it was going to be for the tour, but that doesn't include your tickets in. Somehow when we bought the tour, they forgot to charge us for our tickets. So we got a fucking double fuck of a hard moment right there and didn't pay for our tickets to get in. So what we paid for the tour would have been equivalent for both of our tickets. So we saved a little bit of money that way he had an ipad that he was carrying around and he was showing us pictures of what is actually inside of the pyramid did you know what you see on the outside is like the third pyramid that they've built oh no i didn't and it's actually built on top of a cenote and so that was very interesting too they say that you can't enter the cenote from chichen itza what they think happened because this was a sacred spot that they did sacrifices They think that one of the surrounding cenotes, if you go underwater, will lead to the cenote under Chichen Itza. But everyone who privately owns that land doesn't want them to map that out because then they would be losing their income because they're probably using that cenote for leisure, right? Because if it gets found that that cenote leads to Chichen Itza, all the scientists and archaeologists and everybody's going to come there and they're afraid that they're going to lose their livelihood in a sense. So they recently found out that there was a second pyramid under there that they had built. So they thought there was two. Then more recently, they found out, oh, shit. 
forget there's actually a third one and they were able to do it with like x-ray imaging and all sorts of different things. And that is the one that covers the cenote. But basically when non-native people to Mexico discovered Chichen Itza, they said, oh my gosh, like, look at this. We're going to clear the area. And with the rubble that had fallen off, they rebuilt two sides of the pyramid, but they weren't able to rebuild the other two because villagers that lived in the area had already previously like taken that stone and pretty much built their homes and other things with that. So when you're there, all the good images that you see, if you Google Chichen Itza, show the rebuilt side that they did. And then the other two sides aren't redone. So it's crazy to see that difference between the two of them. But Chichen Itza is also very famous because what was it at the summer solstice or is it the which solstice is it? I think it's the summer solstice. In the summer solstice, the sun lines up perfectly to create a shadow that the steps that go to the top of the pyramid create like a serpent shape. Like it's famous. Like, oh. so they're talking when you do the tour all about the mathematics that went behind building here and what the Mayans did and how they were able to figure all this stuff out. And my mind was just blown there, Kim. And I even said this to Brittany. I said, Kim would have loved mm-hmm. this place. Yeah, there's even a Mayan ball court where they would play a sport. And then we even learned that the winning captain of the team, because they won and, you know, it was considered to be such a gift to be sacrificed, that if you won this game, the losing captain would kill the winning team leader as a sacrifice. And it would be like an honor to be sacrificed and killed there. You wanted to win so you could die. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, just completely different culture. We learned so much about the history and so glad that we got the guide because like Jamal said earlier, there are no signs anywhere. You can't find this information unless you're with a guy that's telling you the story. Our guide was Mayan. So that was very interesting to hear his perspective of things. And then after Chichen Itza, we went to Cenote Suitan. How do you say it, Brittany? You say it, and I feel like I can't say it correctly. I've been calling it Cenote Suitan. Suitan. It's spelled S-U-Y-T-U-N. And this is the one that I mentioned earlier was the least expensive and the freaking coolest one that we actually came across. It is one of the most Instagrammable cenotes in the Yucatan Peninsula. And if Instagram ain't your thing and you ain't doing it for the gram and you just want to actually go, you're still going to enjoy the spot. Like, honestly, this was the cenote wow. to go to. The picture looks really cool. It's like a platform that you walk out onto and get married on. This is a very deep cenote. So, I mean, it has you, to be man made. Yeah, the well, platform the, is. The, yeah, the platform is man made. So, basically, you know, you're at regular ground level and then you take stairs down into the cave. And it's a normal cave with stalagmites, stalactites, and it has its natural opening, but it's a very small opening. So, during certain times of the year and at the right times of the day, the sun shines right through in on there. But it's a big, nice swimming pool area and they built a man-made little walkway area where you can go out and stand in the center and have the sun just beam on you. Like honestly, Google this. It's impressive and this was the least expensive one and I enjoyed this the most. But the water is freezing, freezing. Yeah, so there are times of the year, depending on like how much rain has been in the area where the platform isn't covered in water. And so you could stand on it, you know, with shoes and and all of that. When we went, the platform was covered in water up to about our shin, but it still had great photos, like perfect opportunity. They do limit how long you can stay on the platform to take the photos. It's like limited to one minute per person, but everyone wants to wait and get that IG pose, of course. If you want to swim in the cenote, they do require you to wear a life jacket. And there are these beautiful black fish that are swimming right next to you. They're like little baby catfish. They almost have like the whiskers and stuff. And catfish inherently are ugly fish. But these ones were like cute little looking black catfish. I mean, it it was really cool. But I do like how they limited you to the one minute. They actually had somebody, if you went longer than a minute, he would blow a whistle at you telling you to get your ass off of that Mm -hmm. so other people can take it. 
But if you are actually there and swimming in the cenote, I'm going to throw out something. I'm going to call out these fuckers who just hang out behind the platform while you're taking your photo. Like people would come and not even in the switch of person to person, like kind of pass to the other side. Like people are there just chilling in front of the platform. And it's like it ruins your shot of that solo shot. There is plenty of space on either side for you to linger and lounge and swim without photobombing somebody. So if you're listening to this, like I'm just saying, like do not photobomb somebody and stand in there because when it came time to take Britney's photo, some asshole just decided, yeah, I'm going to lounge right here and uh, lollygagging around like a doucher. And so it ruined her original photos. We had to re-wait in line. Luckily, it wasn't too crowded and we got them, but don't be that person. Well, you can also just get an app to remove them from your picture. That's yeah, true, true, but you know, you still want to know that it's pure and... uh we ended up getting it. So this one was a really cool one. I highly recommend the cenote and you should for sure do it if you go to Chichen Itza. So I'm going to call Jamal out for a moment because this is one of the cenotes where you have to shower before you get in. And there was a woman's locker room and a shower area. So we changed, put on our bathing suits. And in the woman's locker room, I showered and just got wet there. And I guess they didn't have that in the men's room. And so there are showers outside too. And Jamal was like, I don't really want to shower. So he tried to pull it off that he showered on the inside. And a guide came up to him and was like, no, you need a shower. You need a shower. And he... <laughs> Dirty. <laughs> well, I didn't even know if I was going to get in. Brittany wanted to go in more so for the photo and not to swim. And the water is like cold. I didn't want to get wet. So yeah, I, I tried to pull a fast one and uh, they were able to see right through it. So, you know, <laughs> they really do make sure that you actually shower in that situation. That was pretty funny. Jamal's like, I don't want to shower. You know, you know, Jamal. But this one was only 150 pesos. And like I said, the cheapest. I mean, this came to like $7.50 per person compared to other places that were like 300 and 500 that we mentioned. I mean, this one was a bargain and this one was the best one. But on our way back to Tulum, we stopped in Valladolid, which is a major city in Yucatan. It is a restored colonial Spanish town. So when you go through there, it almost has a little bit of European vibes. You don't feel like you're really in Mexico. The buildings are a classic Spanish colonial. It almost had that vibe like when we were in Quito, Kim, you know, with certain aspects of the building. So that was really cool. And they're famous for its food scene that they have right there. Cenotes in the area. And clearly it's gaining popularity due to its proximity to Chichen Itza. So if you're going to be driving out to Chichen Itza yourself, highly recommend stopping in Valladolid. Check out the food scene as well as the classic colonial Spanish architecture. So day seven was one of our chill days. We woke up and it was literally pouring outside. Like you could hear the rain come down. We're like, oh my God, is it raining outside? It sounded super stormy. But then, you know, 10 minutes later, it clears up and mm -hmm. sunny sky. So we're like, OK, let's get out in the town. And we had gone a few times to get coffee at a Chili Killies place, actually. And we really wanted to go back to the town because every vacation we go on, we try to find a Christmas ornament to put on our Christmas tree every year. And we hadn't found one yet. So we went and done that. And this is the day Jamal had his famous freak out. I was waiting for this. <laughs> on the last day, it's almost like when we were in Mexico City and my phone got jacked from me. On the last day <laughs> here is when uh, the freak out arose. But this one was a justifiable one. I'm not going to lie, my fault. I hit a vehicle. Um, what? Yeah, well, we had parked to go walking, trying to find that ornament. Maybe we were going to go back to that Chilaquiles place to get the Cafe de Oya, which was delicious. I mean, who doesn't want like cinnamon flavored coffee? I mean, it's pristine. It's great. I mean, I love it. So that was the game plan. And then, you know, I mean, I guess anywhere this could happen. But Mexico be Mexico. You know, people just uh, double park and vendors that have trucks are trying to drop stuff off on narrow streets. And so I was kind of like trapped by a delivery truck on a one way road trying to get out. And I was concerned with the car that was parked on the other side of the one way road. And so I just um, was worried about hitting that car that I didn't pay attention to the proximity of me to the park truck that was in front of me and to my side. And then I ended up scraping 
the rental car. Uh And so that kind of like put a little damper in my day. Like a a big scrape, a small scrape. Oh, I mean, it went from the driver's side door to the passenger door. I mean, it was a a good one. It was uh, had some had some deep longevity to it, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, you could hear it. You just kept going. Well, I, at that point, it's like, am I going to back up and then scratch it on the other way? Yeah, I, I, I kept going. It, it was what it was uh, at that My point God. in time. And you know what? Luckily, they forced me to buy the car insurance, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but one thing to note is if you read the car insurance contract, a lot of the time it will say if you leave the scene, it voids your insurance. Yeah, without reporting it. Without reporting it. And so you have to report it like where it happened. And we were supposed to go to the beach after this and Jamal pulled his famous, I just want to go home, Brittany. Uh-oh. Well, just freaking well, out the whole well, day. Well, home was the Airbnb. But no, then we got to the beach. We got in the water, enjoyed it. Had some more beer on the beach with our portable collapsible cooler. I mean, <laughs> the day got a little bit better uh, for us at that end of time. But yeah, I mean, who wants to damage a rental car? So mm-hmm. yeah, that ruined my day and I had a little bit of a freak out. But a little bit of a freak out. I pulled it together and I enjoyed the rest of the day. We enjoyed the beach. We found that ornament, mind you, and we enjoyed dinner the final night out at a place called Las Margaritas. Had some margaritas. I had chili rellenos. Ooh, it was delicious. God, this was I love like, chili rellenos. Yeah, this was the first time, like, instead of just getting tacos, which, by the way, taco scene down there is not like the Baja California taco scene. <laughs> Maybe pass on it. I'm just going to throw that out there. But traditional other Mexican food, pretty good. Enjoyed the chili rellenos. What did you have, Brittany? I forgot. I think I had the flautas, mm. which were really good. Flautas were good. I was in my trip to Idaho and Montana recently i was in the airport waiting to come home and this guy was on his phone he obviously had some issues he was trying to get home and he was complaining about how he had to pay blah blah blah. he was like i just want to go home and i thought of you right away jamal yeah (laughs) it's a it's a natural sentiment to have and i'm glad to see that i'm not the only one in the world that has it when it goes wrong i think it's just whiny guys that have that it's the adult way of crying for your mommy without asking for your mommy i think is what it is i just want to go home (laughs) But yeah, that wrapped up Tulum for us, quite honestly. You know, the next day we woke up just it was a travel day to Cancun. When we landed there, we really didn't explore it. So we drove around. Cancun was really nice. We went to the resort area and just kind of went down, looked at the beach and everything like that. Um, But just pretty much hung out at the airport. I will say that the beaches in Cancun did look better than the beaches in Tulum. So Jamal and I are interested in going back to Cancun, maybe trying an all-inclusive for a few oh, days. Hell yeah. Like two, oh, yeah. three days. Can't believe I've never done that. I mean, I really enjoyed what I saw in Cancun. And, you know, I know we touched upon this, but I guess we really didn't talk about it. Like the resort area of Tulum, like Tulum became popular so fast that I don't think they put a lot of thought into how they built it. Like it's on this one little narrow road. Mm-hmm. It's a shitty paved road. Everything's crowded. It doesn't really have space for pedestrians. A lot of those resort areas, if you're not even staying at the resort, they don't even let you go in it. You can't access the beaches from there. And then you go to Cancun, it's these beautiful, lovely paved roads with palm trees lining it and beautiful beaches and beautiful resorts. So, I mean, I love Tulum and I'm not going to sit here and say it wasn't nice, but again, what is the done up touristy area isn't cool as other areas of Tulum and let alone Cancun. So I'm ready to go back and actually experience that. And the whole drive from Cancun to Tulum is roughly two hours. There's a lot of places in between. There's Playa del Carmen, which Mm -hmm. is really nice as well. And when I was there, I stayed at a little offshoot community called, I think it was like Playa Aventuras or something like that. And there's this whole dolphin experience there. I got to like swim with dolphins and also really nice gated community. Oh, very nice. I mean, there's lots of places along. And that's why I'm saying like pretty soon Bacalar is going to be on that list. Everywhere down from Cancun to Belize is going to be lined up in a touristy area in that area pretty soon within the next 10 years. That is for certain. And last little tidbit, we almost missed our flight. They told us it was going to be delayed. Brittany and I are sitting in the lounge. In the lounge, they didn't actually have any of the boards up or announcements. Actually, they did have a board up, but the board was wrong that said our flight time. And whatever 
whatever intuition or inkling Brittany had, she just ended up Googling it and, oh, they were boarding. So by the time we got to the gate, it was final boarding call and we were literally the last ones on the plane and almost missed it. And I would have been so pissed. <laughs> you yeah. definitely would have had a freak out. Oh, I would have been so freaking pissed. So you would pissed. would have had a bigger freak so, out. But we made it home. Yeah, yeah. And let me tell you something. Tulum and using it as a hub and exploring that area, super, super fun. But the resort area isn't as impressive as what you see like for those Instagram shots. If you do a lot of the other stuff, I think you're going to enjoy it a lot more. But that's my own personal preference. So we have a couple questions of the week. First question here. You guys spent seven days. Our question here is asking how many days you actually need in Tulum. I really think it depends on what you want to do. I think five would be a good amount. I was happy with the seven, but we don't usually relax a lot on vacation. And so we did have a day or two where we did rest a little bit more than we normally do. And that was really, really nice. Yeah, I would definitely say the same, especially if you're going to use it as a hub. You want to spend a full day. I mean, you're going to spend a full day going to Chichen Itza. It's literally a full day to go to Bacalar, even though it's close in terms of drive wise time. But, you know, the amount of time you want to spend there. So if you want to explore Tulum, the cenotes, other stuff, I would definitely agree with that five to seven day time frame. And then my question, how much should you budget for a five day trip? Ooh, that's a really good question. I want to say we probably spent for everything around three grand. That's including our rental car, our Airbnb for the week, our flights, all of our excursions and our food. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, food wise is going to definitely be expensive to eat out in that area. So if you're staying at an Airbnb, definitely go to some of the grocery stores there and purchase some food and make stuff for yourself. I mean, we made breakfast every day. And then with what we had and brought for lunch, they were sometimes like liner situations. So we managed quite well. But if you were to want to eat out every day and do stuff, definitely budget more. It's a lot more expensive than you think. And that was for two people. So Mm -hmm. just one person would be like 1500, I'd say. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely on the higher end for Mexico. Yeah, definitely on the higher end for Mexico. But, you know, we really enjoyed what we did. And it was a good substitute for not being able to go to Morocco. And Tulum has been on our list for a while now. So I'm glad we were able to enjoy this vacation. Good. I'm glad you had fun, you guys. I'm sorry your trip was canceled, but sounds like you made up for it with this one. Absolutely. All right, squaddies, thank you so much for tuning in to our Tulum episode. Keep the adventures going with us on social media. Follow us on Instagram. You know our handle is at Travel Squad Podcast. Send us in your questions of the week. And if you're going somewhere cool that you'd recommend, tag us in your adventures. If you found the information in this episode to be useful, or if you thought we were just plain funny, please be sure to share it with a friend that would enjoy it too. And as always, please subscribe, rate and review our podcast, and tune in every Travel Tuesday for new episodes. Stay tuned for next week's episode. We have some more amazing adventures and tips in store for you. Bye, Bye, everybody.